it's a great pleasure to be here this evening. This lecture will last about an hour. I will play several musical examples and complete pieces on these quiet domestic instruments, which have been subtly amplified so you can hear them in this splendid but far from domestic opera theatre. The word curation has acquired new meaning in the last two decades. In his recent book, Curation, the Power of Selection in a World of Excess, Michael Baskar defined curation as using acts of selection and arrangement, but also refining, reducing, displaying, simplifying, presenting and explaining to add value. This new expanded definition reflects the wider usage and popular status which the word curation currently enjoys. For example, it is now common for the direction of media and arts events to be referred to as curation. In this modern sense, performers are curators and their creative activity and its dissemination is curation. Basker's semantic observation acknowledges the proliferation of online information and highlights the need for expert knowledge to decipher the confusing burden of internet material. For performers of historical music, Bascar's catch-all definition gathers together many of the diverse activities we undertake. The role of curator was also very much in fashion when the Royal College of Music, RCM, was founded in 1882. Although the word curation then meant something quite different, a cure or healing. In the 19th century, curators not only took care to preserve things, the custodian of a university museum, for example, but were also collectors who, like their internet counterparts today, selected according to taste, adding and subtracting value as they did so. Some of the fruits of this 19th century fashion for collecting can be seen on the stage tonight. The founding fathers of the RCM equipped their fledgling training school for musicians with two very important tools for historical inquiry about music. A large library of manuscripts and printed books and an equally distinguished museum of musical instruments. These collections overlap historically and contextually and encourage what we might call a creative cross-referencing between musical source materials and the medium of their sounding. Today, their close proximity in a single building enables our musicians to bring into sound vital and otherwise silent witnesses from the musical past. From the museum, I have chosen to play this spinet, RCM 179, a plucked stringed instrument of the harpsichord family. It was made by Stephen Keane in London in about 1685, the year in which Johann Sebastian Bach, George Frederick Handel and Domenico Scarlatti were all born. Its winged shaped design, with the strings running obliquely to the line of the keys and the bass strings furthest from the player, gives a large tone and range whilst only occupying a compact floor area. For these reasons of utility and visual aesthetic, the bent side spinet replaced the rectangular virginal as the domestic instrument of choice in Britain during the last quarter of the 17th century. This particular instrument was given to the college in 1895 by Sir George Grove, the first director of the RCM and author of the famous eponymous Dictionary of Music. Here is a short prelude by Locke uh, on the spinet.
That prelude by Locke is piece number 14 in this important English keyboard manuscript on the far side of the stage, RCM Manuscript 2093, which you can see on the slides. This manuscript was copied during the 1660s and 1670s, shortly before Stephen Keane's spinet was made. The manuscript is an early example of a retrospective keyboard compilation assembled over several, several decades to preserve earlier repertoire. As a document of contemporary performing practice and musical pedagogy, the manuscript reveals important evidence about fingering, ornamentation, figured bass and keyboard improvisation. Reading from both ends, the book contains two series of pieces. From one end, uh, a series of preludes, and from the other, by reversing the book, a series of fugues, here called voluntaries and fantasias. It is, in effect, an early collection of preludes and fugues, a proto-well-tempered clavier. I will now play piece number 25, an anonymous voluntary. It is based on two seemingly different contrapuntal ideas or points, exposed successively, but not in combination. However, the two themes are in fact closely related. Omitting the third, fifth and seventh notes from the first theme reveals the chain of thirds used in the second theme. It also reveals a strong similarity to the inverted form of the theme of Sebastian Bach's The Art of Fugue. The voluntary ends with a passage of freer music using rapid scales in the manner of an improvised toccata. The combination of fugue with toccata was very common at this time and part of an aesthetic which seeks to reconcile and complement opposites, bring order to chaos and to edify the listener through musical discourse and rhetoric. Before the voluntary, I will play the preceding piece in the manuscript, a short prelude also called voluntary by Benjamin Rogers.
The idea that Johann Jakob Froberger's contrapuntal music might need some positive curation occurred to me while I was writing an article for the 400th anniversary of his birth. It became clear that, with a few notable exceptions, Froberger's fugues are only infrequently performed or discussed, and consequently audiences seldom hear them. The pieces are of a very high quality, however, so why are they not more frequently played? What is so difficult about them? Some background. Froberger was born in Stuttgart in 1616. He went to Vienna in the 1630s, perhaps as a singer, where he enjoyed imperial patronage, becoming court organist in 1637. He was sent to Rome to study with Frescobaldi and probably with the polymath Athanasius Kircher, and travelled widely to Dresden, Brussels, Utrecht, Paris, London, and probably Madrid. After the death of his patron, Ferdinand III, Froberger fell from favour in Vienna and lived out his remaining days in relative obscurity in northeastern France, where he died in 1667. Froberger's music occupies a central position in the development of three Baroque forms the fugue, the toccata, and the suite. Of his 130 or so surviving keyboard works, 50 are fugues, 28 are toccatas, and the remainder are suites or variations. Froberger deliberately restricted the availability of his pieces during his lifetime, and, according to Sibylla of Württemberg, his patron in his last years, only those who had heard Froberger himself play could hope to perform his works correctly. The most extreme manifestation of his personal style can be found in the Lamentations, where poignant sentiment deliberately subverts the normal tonal, harmonic and rhythmic expectation. Here is an example, the Lamentation on the death of Ferdinand IV, who died in 1654, aged 20. That's the very beautiful autograph score. The final ascending scale of the piece represents the, his soul rising to heaven. And you can see on the slide the court scribe and calligrapher, Johann Friedrich Sauter, who illustrated Froberger's autograph, has depicted the event with clouds and angels at the bottom right-hand side of the second page. That's the scale, and that's the illustration. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but first, um, a word about the clavichord. The clavichord was probably the most frequently used keyboard for the performance of Froberger's music in the 17th and 18th centuries. These are photographs of RCM 211, a clavichord built by Arnold Dolmetsch after an original by Johann Haas made in Hamburg in 1763 and bought by Sir George Grove in 1894 for the use of RCM piano students. Thus, clavichord teaching officially began at the RCM almost 125 years ago. Grove's prescient vision continues today with the clavichord tuition of our harpsichordists, organists, and pianists. The sound of the clavichord is made by striking the strings with a metal blade, the tangent, not by plucking them. The strings remain sounding only while the key is depressed, keeping the tangent in contact with them. The player can control the initial dynamic of each note by varying the force and speed of their touch, and can alter the sounding string by changing the pressure on the key and even raise the pitch. The clavichord is the only keyboard instrument which allows this degree of touch sensitivity. The clavichord remains the single most important instrument on which to teach historical keyboard touch and sound. I will play Froberger's lamentation upon the death of Ferdinand IV on this uh, clavichord by Derek Adlam after Hubert which is regularly used for teaching and which was given to the college by Virginia Pleasance, who occasionally taught harpsichord at the RCM while she lived in London.
At first glance, the scores of Froberger's fugues look somewhat empty and unexciting, especially so after the overt and emotional pictorialism of that lamentation. They are, however, no less imaginative or well-constructed, and their steady discourse encompasses a broad range of affect. Let us briefly define in terms of the image in front of you what a fugue is. This is the opening of Fantasia No. 2 by Froberger. <laughs> fugue is a multi-voiced texture in which two types of section alternate, differentiated by their formal function. In sections of the first type, the opening melody, called the subject, is always heard at least once in its entirety. The entries of the subject are marked on the screen in red boxes. Notice that the tenor begins with the counter-subject, unusually in this piece, not the subject. In these sections, the subject can be transformed by one of the established techniques of counterpoint, for example, by inversion or retrograde motion. In the second type of section, called episode, a full statement of the subject is deliberately avoided. Episodes develop short units of melody called motives or motifs, often derived from the subject but without a complete statement of the subject. The three passages of episode are marked in green uh, on the slide. It is in the episode of a fugue that we are most likely to encounter the composer's lyrical imagination at work. Many of Froberger's fugues have extensive episodes and these often require similarly imaginative handling from the player. Poetry has been likened to counterpoint and vice versa. Here is a light-hearted illustration of subject and episode in verse. This is the subject. Oops. And this is the answer. This is the episode. And this is the final entry of <laughs> final entry of the subject. Here's another one we prepared earlier. Subject. Answer. <laughs> Oops. Well, never mind. Episode was the two lines in the middle and subject at the very end. The themes Froberger and Fantasia develop with each line. A rhyme, of course, is uh, only a single line of text, a monody, while fugue is polyphonic. And a fugue also has no fixed form. The structure of every fugue is different and evolves sui generis directly from its themes and contrapuntal devices. These limericks progress their ideas and their humour over time. A fugue is also a progression or movement of ideas over time, and it makes sense of its material, or not, by ordering temporal events through a balance of similarity and contrast. Froberger wrote two types of contrasting fugue. The eight Fantasias and 16 Ricercars form a more severe set, and the seven Canzonas and 19 Capriccios form a lighter, more rhythmically varied group. The Fantasias and Ricercars complement the overtly fantastical elements of the Toccatas and Lamentations and furnish a different facet of the Stylus Fantasticus that of the fantasy or inventive imagination of the composer. Today I will discuss two fantasies by Froberger, number two and number five. Fugue demands a high degree of oral engagement from the listener and benefits from repeated listening. William Byrd, one of the greatest English contrapuntists, reminds us that, I quote, a song that is well and artificially made cannot be well perceived nor understood at first hearing. But the oftener you shall hear it, the better cause of liking you will discover." Unquote. From the performer, fugue requires complete fluency in counterpoint, an excellent oral awareness, and an instinctive musical imagination which can respond and react in the moment of each sounding note. 
This reactive quality relies upon what I have chosen to call, for the purposes of this lecture, the lyrical imagination, by which I mean the ability to connect emotion with sound. Performers rely on this instinct. Composers and listeners also share it. I was inspired to coin the term lyrical imagination by a passage in Joseph Kerman's book, The Art of Fugue, published in 2005, where he describes Contrapunctus 10 from J.S. Bach's The Art of Fugue. Here is his musical example, and here is what Kerman writes. The second episode blurs its underlying structure by means of a wonderfully skillful lyric gesture in the soprano. It shifts the three-note upbeat motif to another position in the sequential unit. Example 8a attempts to elucidate this. The actual soprano line from the score has been extracted and printed with stems pointing down, while the strict sequence that was Bach's starting point is shown with the dotted stems pointing up. I will now play bars 75 to 89 from this piece. This passage forms a sandwich in which the episode is the filling and the appearance of the subject forms the bread on either side. You will hear the famous um, Art of Fugue theme first in F major in the right hand in sixths, then the episode in question, and then the Art of Fugue theme in D minor in the left hand, simultaneously combined with the initial subject of Contrapunctus 10 in thirds in the right hand. Herman's choice of the word lyric is very apt for this, one of the most beautiful and moving passages in the entire Art of Fugue. It also perfectly sums up both the effect and technique of this fugal episode. Here, Bach creates a memorable melody from short, simple motifs sliced off the initial theme. Froberger often does likewise. He too employs moments of melodic rapture between the more prosaic statements of the subject. Like Bach, his fugues develop motifs in a continuous manner, and his episodes give opportunity for lyrical invention and rhapsody. I will give some specific examples from Froberger in a moment. Before I do that, here is this evening's first leap of imagination. Here are four examples from a 17th century fugue which does not exist. At least no source has yet been found for it. It exists only in my imagination. I have written the start of four sections so you can see and hear them. Let me take you through some of the features and then play each in turn. Section one, theme in uh, long note values as a cantus firmus. First in the alto, then in the soprano. Section two, theme in inversion in the soprano. Section three, theme in diminution in the alto, that is with note values halved. And section four, theme in tripla in the soprano, that is each note divided into three minims. I'll just play those so you can hear them. The opening. The 
inversion. Diminution. And finally, tripler. I'll let you hear that again. Please notice the solmization symbols I've used for the opening theme. Ut, Fa, Re, Sol, Mi, La. And the inversion, La, Mi, Sol, Re, Fa, Ut. Solmization symbols are an early form of tonic sol fa, a method for sight reading attributed to the 10th century monk Guido of Arezzo. The six pitches shown form the natural hexachord and are the first six notes of what we call the C major scale. The hexachord was the foundation of all contrapuntal melody. By now, some of you will have recognised that my imaginary fugue has a 19th century manifestation, namely the two fugal movements in Beethoven's piano sonata in A-flat major, opus 110. Here is the second fugue of Beethoven's opus 110, played on the clavichord, an instrument, by the way, that Beethoven knew. The two fugues in Beethoven's Opus 110 are both hexachord fantasias. Coincidentally, Froberger wrote a famous hexachord fantasia, his only published composition, and so did Beethoven's counterpoint teacher, Albrecht's Berger. Perhaps Beethoven's use of the hexachord in this piano sonata, arranged without stepwise intervals, is a conscious breach of fugal convention and a deliberate restriction or obligo of his compositional imagination. You may have noticed that I allowed you to study the musical example silently before I played it. The visual appreciation of fugue is very important. In the score, the visual and the oral meet. Here is the opening of the autograph of Froberger's Fantasia No. 2 on the left-hand side, which I described a few minutes ago. And next to it is Edward Danreuter's copy made in 1892, a few years before he became piano professor at the RCM in 1895. Notice Danreuter uses the same two-stave piano score notation we are familiar with today. I presume he was working from copies derived from the posthumous engravings of this piece and not Froberger's open score autograph. Perhaps Danreuter's source was the Austrian pianist Ernst Pauer, Danreuter's predecessor as principal piano professor at the RCM. Pauer enjoyed a very successful career as a concert pianist in London. 
From 1861, he began a pioneering series of historical chronological performances on harpsichord and piano, using editions which he subsequently published from 1866 onwards. Many of, uh, amongst his many attractive and inexpensive editions, he, he included a single toccata by Froberger. In addition to its visual and oral presentations, fugue is also a tactile medium. For the performer, fugue is very much a physical experience. The player is most likely to be using a keyboard, a technology for sounding strings, pipes and bells, invented, at least in the form we know it, over six centuries ago. Through this keyboard, the performer both feels and hears the music they are reading or imagining. Here is Charles Rosen writing about Bach's fugues in 1975. Only the performer at the keyboard is in a position to appreciate the movement of the voices, their blending and their separation, their interaction and their contrasts. A fugue of Bach can be fully understood only by the one who plays it, not only heard but felt through the muscles and nerves. Part of the essential conception of the fugue is the way in which voices that the fingers can feel to be individual and distinct are heard as part of an inseparable harmony. The confusion of vertical and horizontal movement is one of the delights of fugue. As Rosen points out, the vertical and horizontal axes apply not only to the visual and oral, but also to the tactile. The act of learning to play a fugue requires a dexterous choreography in which vertical incisions from the score are translated in the mind and then laid out horizontally on the keyboard and between the hands. In my 2016 article about Froberger, I highlighted the extent of motivic construction and transformation in his Fantasias and Ricicars. This aspect of contrapuntal thinking is evident at all levels of his fugue collections, encompassing the construction of themes or subjects, the transformation of themes within and between successive fugues, and the deployment of contrapuntal artifice. The range of devices include Cantus firmus, double invertible counterpoint, counterfugue or fuga contraria, fugal inversion or inversion of fugal answer, double fugue, stretto, augmentation and diminution, obligi and ingani. It's really the last two that we're going to talk about now. Obligi are restrictions placed upon contrapuntal invention by requiring or prohibiting the use of specific techniques. Frescobaldi, for example, avoids any stepwise motion in his eighth Ricciacar, the uh, first published in 1615, and of course the two hexachord fantasias by Beethoven, if we're going to call them that from Opus 110, also avoid stepwise motion, at least in the theme. In Gani, or deceptions, are transformations of subject material through hexachord manipulation. Defined by Artusi in 1603, I quote, the ingano occurs whenever one voice part beginning a subject is succeeded by another that does not use the same melodic intervals but nevertheless retains the same hexachord syllables. Here is Artusi's example with a modern interpretation of the authentic hexachords below. Dealing with the lower part first, illustration B, this shows the soft, natural and hard hexachords and their solmization syllables. The six note natural hexachord, notes one to six of the C major scale, can be transposed up a perfect fifth to give the hard hexachord which begins on G. By adding the notes Mi and Fa from the hard hexachord to the natural hexachord, 
we complete our C major scale by providing its seventh note, B hard, or B natural as we now call it, in German the letter H. Similarly, the soft hexachord is generated by a downwards transposition of a fifth. This requires a lower or softened B, the origin of our flat sign. Notice that the soft, natural and hard hexachords interlock and their pitches share syllables in a pattern which repeats over the octave. Above it, illustration A shows Artusi's two different melodies. Both derive from the same solmization syllables, sol, la, fa, la, but their pitches and interval structure are different. Each change from one hexachord to another is called a mutation. Ingano originated with Adrian Villette and the 16th century polyphonists. Keyboard examples have been found in Trabacci and Frescobaldi, and through my recent work in Froberger. An application to both words and music can be found in Francesco Cortecci's madrigal, Se vostri occhi lucenti. Cortecci restricts his choice of pitches by obliging himself to set every vowel of the poem to a pitch with the same solmization vowel, yet creating affective word setting and correct harmony and counterpoint. Such extreme applications of obligi were not uncommon and display the composer's inventive virtuosity. The tonal range of Ingani was commonly extended to include chromaticism, a semitone pitch change but without change of syllable. And by introducing artificial hexachords, that is to say, more distant transpositions than just the soft and the hard hexachords. Here are the different types of ingani in Froberger's Fantasia No. 5, which I'm going to play in a moment, arranged to show their progressive evolution. So the start of the piece is at the top and really the end of the piece is at the end. What's quite interesting about this, I think, is that Froberger's tune in its prime, what I call the prime order, its basic form emerges only at the very end of the piece, not at the very beginning. So in other words, the deception is only finally resolved at the very end of the piece. Um, I'll play each of these tunes so that you can hear them. So this is bar one, the initial subject of the fugue. This is the answer, bar two. This is bar 12. Bar 16. Bar 39. Bar 45. And finally, the revealed prime form using only this natural C hexachord, the letters La, Re, La, Sol, Fa, Mi. Ingani offers a paradox of the visual and oral, namely that the most radical and extreme Ingani are the most difficult for the listener and player to uncover, the most deceptive. All ingani can be explained visually once they have been puzzled out, but the more complex the mutation, the less orally convincing is its melodic relationship to the original subject. Although we cannot be certain that Froberg intended them as such, a contemporary performer fluent in solmization would have read the implied solmization syllables at sight. The Ingani in Fantasia No. 5, uh, once revealed, are a concrete technique within the composition, whether a conscious intention of the composer or not. 
Here is the score of Fantasia number no. 5 with its five sections and thematic transitions marked and my performance of it. Certain similarities between Beethoven and Froberger are conspicuous. Both were German keyboard virtuosi who settled in Vienna. Both were obsessed with fugue and both composed with a profound awareness of mu musical motive in all its generative possibilities. Most importantly, both understood solmization. Beethoven was taught solmization by Albrechtsberger and probably by his other teachers, Nefer and Haydn. And it is likely he knew some of Froberger's music, most probably the hexachord Fantasia. Here, then, is an example of Ingani in middle period Beethoven. I use solmization to describe motivic process in the Archduke Trio, Opus 97, and the first Razumovsky Quartet, Opus 59, number 1. The Archduke Trio is notable for its expansive form and its eloquent and sometimes disturbing preoccupation with subdominant tonality. In Inganic thinking, the soft hexachord is the equivalent of the subdominant key. If you look at letter B, 
Bars one and three of its opening movement share the same solmization syllables. Sol, la, mi, fa. The ingano concerns the first two notes, bar one and bar three, which are different pitches. In bar one, you have C and E. In bar three, you have G and A. But both share the same solmization syllables. The exact same sol, la, mi, fa pattern appears on the opening page of Albrechtsberger's composition treatise, the book he used to teach Beethoven in 1794, and that's uh, at letter A up at the top of the page. I'm going to play example B for you. Um, just so that you can follow the motivic development as indicated. So this is uh, letter B, very famous piece. Bar eight, cello. Bar 21, interruption. Most extraordinary of all, augmented sixth, subdominant, cadence, which happens three times a week, but we'll just play it once. The opening of the first Razumovsky Quartet, C letter C, please, completed only four years before Beethoven began sketching the Archduke Trio, uses exactly the same Sol, La, Mi, Fa formula. As the Archduke Trio, sorry, ex uses exactly the same Sol, La, Mi, Fa formula as the Archduke Trio, but without the initial mutation. In the string quartet, the note pitches are drawn from the hard hexachord, the equivalent of the dominant. The illustration shows the motivic outline of the opening cello and violin solos. And again, I'll just play those for you so you can hear them. Illustration C. Um, again, very well-known piece, I think. This slide shows the thematic relationships between the four movements of Opus 59, number one, using solmization. I'm not going to play this. I think it's self-evident just from the letters how the system works. The principle that solmization can explain the connection between scale patterns and disjunct motifs holds for other middle period works, the violin concerto, for example. So far as I'm aware, this aspect of solmization is not represented in the literature of Beethoven analysis and pedagogy. I offer one final example of Beethoven's indebtedness to time-honored contrapuntal technique. His last string quartet, Opus 135, also his last completed work. Commentators have noted this witty but profound quartet's retrospective, nostalgia, and classical lyricism. The introduction to the finale, entitled The Difficult Decision, uses a three-note motif in which Beethoven adds the text, Must It Be? The three notes inverted become, It Must Be. And in this form, they permeate the affirmative concluding allegro. By adding text to his themes, 
Beethoven invokes a long tradition of contrapuntal parody stemming back to Josquin in the late 15th century and encompassing at least two fugues by Froberger. The science of fugue operates in obvious and hidden or deceptive ways. And paradoxically, its strictures and disciplines liberate the best composers to give free, re free reign to their intuitive and inventive imaginations. We have seen how the subject and motivic material of a fugue permeate its entire structure and add to the finesse and beauty of the whole. The listener may be blissfully aware of these arcane operations, and perhaps should be, but their ineffable qualities are perceived nevertheless. They are the lifeblood and soul of the music. Music students today struggle studying counterpoint and fugue. Nothing new there. In Froberger's day, counterpoint was also taught to the young, but approached more practically, and often at the keyboard, especially as improvisation. Bach, Mozart, Haydn and Beethoven were schooled in the same contrapuntal techniques as Froberger. They also applied them through their keyboard facility. That Viennese music from the early 19th century, such as Beethoven's, contains evidence of the contrapuntal thinking from an earlier time, should encourage us to explore the classical and romantic repertoire with our ears and minds attuned to the teaching and plain traditions of the pre-classical era. Only through the highest levels of musical hearing and creativity can we hope to understand and perform fugue well. Our lyrical imaginations must be sensitised to the subtleties of motive and counterpoint. Composers of the quality of Froberger, Bach and Beethoven were trained from an early age to, watch, to, to work at this high level of perception which they took for granted and which they utilised throughout their lives. To paraphrase the astronomer and musician William Herschel, listening is an art which must be learnt. In other words, we fail to hear detail if we don't know how to listen. My idea of the lyrical imagination has useful applications in performance and teaching, and by reminding us how we should listen, is no less relevant to audiences. To conclude, I would like to play Froberger's Fantasia No. 2, the piece which Edward Danreuter copied out in 1892. He called it a fugue in the Phrygian mode and noted its similarities to the E major fugue in Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, Book 2. <coughs> Lecture notes for 1891 and 1904 belonging to the composer Sir Hubert Parry the second director of the RCM, noted that Froberger, I quote, Frescobaldi's pupil, advanced somewhat in maturity and modulation the example of his master, and that he indeed was one of the most interesting composers of his day and experimented in music for the clavecin as well as music for the organ, unquote. Parry was a pupil of Dan Reuter from 1873, and until Dan Reuter's death in 1905, Parry visited him every week when they were both in London. We can imagine them discussing and playing this piece. Thank you for listening to me.